This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I must confess that some days it's easier to rejoice than others, especially when the sun is out and the snow is gone. Am I right with that? Yeah. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, uh, 11 o'clock, worship in our wonderful and beautiful uh, sanctuary. Uh, we encourage everyone to sign the friendship pad that should be at the end of the pew, and please uh, write your name uh, and address in it. And if you're looking for a church home, we ask that you consider this a place where you can grow in grace and love and learn to love as God loves unconditionally. I've got a couple announcements that I want to lift up. First of all, we want to extend our Christian sympathies to Kathy Brown over the death of her mother on Valentine's. Uh, Kathy Brown and Lucas Brown. Kathy Brown uh, is the Greg Brown's daughter-in-law. We'll be having uh, the a funeral for uh, Kathy's mother, Evelyn Bill Billington, uh, tomorrow in the sanctuary at 2 o'clock, and you all invited. Also, uh, I want to call your attention to the beautiful work, woodwork in our sanctuary. It, do you see it popping and gleaming? Does anybody need any sunglasses? Uh, the reason why I say that is because we had a work day with our nonprofits that also share our building and use this for ministry. Uh, NAMI volunteers and also AG Bells were here yesterday. They probably had about 25 to 30 people. And one of the places they did a deep cleaning was this sanctuary. And so uh, this is something that uh, we are going to be in doing not only with our nonprofits, but also twice a year with our members having a deep cleaning. Uh, because one of the things that's important for us is to uh, be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. And, and this building is a wonderful asset for ministry if we take care of it. It becomes an albatross if we neglect it. So I encourage you to thank uh, our facilities committee for their commitment to care for this place and encourage us to care as well. Uh, the another announcement that I would call your attention to uh, is next Sunday, we'll, following the 11 o'clock service, we'll be having a foundation luncheon. And if you're interested in the concept of a perpetual tithe, a gift that continues to give to support the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian Church, we encourage you to uh, come down to the West Dining Room to learn more about it. And now, let us hear a minute for stewardship on higher education. Over 10 years ago, thanks to a generous bequest from George Hutton, a scholarship fund was started. The fund is endowed annually with the earnings of that bequest. There are brochures on the literature table in the office hallway that contain a bio of Mr. Hutton, as well as information about the scholarships and the graduate loan program. There are also scholarship applications on that table. Over the past 10 years, $32,000 in scholarships has been given to 29 applicants. Applications are mailed to upcoming high school graduates and they can be submitted annually for the duration of any accredited program. They must be received in the church office by April 1st. Other members of the Higher Education Committee are Michelle Murray Klein, Melinda Sears, and Bob Marley. Our main task is to review the applications every April, and we also administer any graduate loans. So if you have any um, interest in being part of that, we welcome new members. Oh, and I forgot to say, this was designed and printed by courtesy of the late Shelley Gabrielson. Thank you. Thank you. As you are able, please stand for our call to worship and prayer. Happy are those whose way is blameless. Happy are those who keep the Lord's decrees. 
Let us worship God. O gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May be seated. Our God is a loving God, therefore let us confess our sins that we might choose life and live. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen.
hear the good news that as far as the east is from the west, so God removes our transgressions from us. Know that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all your sins. Know that you are forgiven. Be at peace. Thanks be to God. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And, also with you. and please take a moment to pass that peace with those around you as the children meet me forward. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing, doing well? Your sticker doesn't want to stay on. Let's put it over there. Well, I've got something in here for you that we can talk about. Anyone know what one of these are? What is it? A milk bottle or a baby bottle? Baby bottle. Does, does anyone that you know, Eli, use one of these? Okay, brothers like, like little Ephraim use baby bottles. Okay, any of you use baby bottles to drink milk? Or maybe you had mommy milk instead? Okay, so sometimes we have baby bottles and then when you get a little older, what happens? Mommy and daddy start to feed you with a spoon, right? Do you, you know about spoons, Ephraim? You're excited, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna, I don't have anything with it today. <laughs> and then maybe you get a little older and then you can start feeding yourself. And so I've got little raisins. Does Ephraim get to feed himself now? Yes. I've seen Ephraim eat. He can eat. <laughs> oh, do you? Yes. You have a lot of baby bottles. What do you think would happen if, if you never, if your, your parents didn't start feeding you with a spoon, they only fed you from a bottle? What do you think would happen if you only drank milk? Do you think you might be hungry if you only had milk? Imagine drinking just milk all one day. Do you think you'd be hungry? Yeah, yeah. You may, you might, you, you can drink the bottle. But if you only had bottle, like, if you were your age, Porter, and you only drank milk, you'd probably be pretty hungry, right? Yes. And you probably wouldn't be as tall as you are now, and you wouldn't probably continue to grow, right, Warren? You wouldn't be as tall. And today, yes, I'm, I'm sorry I've got food for you up here. Today, Pastor Brent is going to talk to, uh, there was a man who wrote a book in the Bible, and he talked about that the church was like only drinking milk, and he wanted them to grow up and to have real food. And so we um, not just want to drink milk, but we want to grow in our faith. 
And so what are some ways that we can grow in learning about God? Do you know ways that you can grow? Okay, by, by eating so we could, so we could, um, <laughs> you could eat with others at church and, and, and have, you guys both eat a lot. So we could pray, read the Bible, and some other things that we can do to grow in our faith. Let us, let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that you want us to grow up in faith. Help us to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead back with your mommy's daddies. Go back to the nurse. I'm sorry. Do you want to go back to your mommy? As we turn to scripture, let us pray together. Loving God, anoint us with your Holy Spirit as we hear your word this day. Fill us with your truth that we might walk in the ways of God to the glory of your realm. Amen. As you know, Pastor Brent and I have been reading through the Sermon on the Mount. And so we continue our words in the Sermon on the Mount and hear the Spirit of those words and how it might have sounded to that first audience as Jesus was giving these words. You've heard it said a long time ago that you should not murder. But you know when you're angry in your heart, that's the same as murdering. So when that guy pulled out in front of you in that car the other day and you called him an idiot, if someone has something against you, and you're taking your gift to the altar, if someone has something against you, not that you have something against them, but they have something against you, leave your gift and go and reconcile to that person and then come back and bring your gift. Or if maybe there's an old enemy that has something against you and uh, he's planning on bringing you to court, settle matters quickly with him before you get taken to court or you'll go off to jail until every last penny is paid. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And you've done a really good job of not physically doing that. But when you look at someone lustfully, it's the same as if your body has done the actual act. So if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, or if your hand causes you to stumble, chop it off, because it would be far better for you to enter heaven with one eye and one hand than to go to hell with two hands and two eyes. And divorce. You're very good at following the law of Moses of giving someone divorce papers, but do you know that the true reason to really get a divorce only is Im- sexual immorality? But you have become selfish, and so at a whim you write divorce papers. Don't you know that if you marry someone who's been divorced, you're causing that person to commit adultery? Again, let your words have meaning. Sometimes we flower things up with religious language, I'll pray for you, and then we don't, or the Lord be with you, and you really don't care about the person. So let your yes be yes, and your no be no. When you manipulate your words to get your own way, you do wrong. Ouch. Harsh words for us. Now let us listen to the choir.
Did you experience the power of juxtaposition? It's fitting that we heard the harsh words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and juxtaposed with the anthem, O oh God, be merciful to me. Because the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is that none of us can live a perfect life. Did you feel as though when Amy was reading an active reading from Jesus' words that you were perfect? All the perfect people, raise your hands. It shows our need for grace and the grace-filled life when God lives God's life in us and through us. Yes, we all need here words of grace and also words of empowerment, taking responsibility for our spiritual growth. And this leads us to the second reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Uh, I'm not going to do an active reading as Amy did. I'm going to stick with the text, but I want you to listen. Really listen. And so Paul writes, And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now, you are still not ready, for you're still on of the flesh. For as long as there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. This ends the reading of God's holy word. May God bless it for our purposes this day. The word of the Lord. Be Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, may the words in my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It has been my experience that every member of most churches would say, whether they're large, a member of a large church or a member of a small church, whether they're a member of a Catholic church or a member of a Protestant church, whether they're a member of a non-denominational church, an evangelical church, a liberal church, and I dare say probably even this church. It has been my experience that most people say they want their church to grow. But it's also been my experience that they want their church to grow with the following condition. If it doesn't involve change. I'm happy for the church to grow, but not let it involve change. Certainly don't change the things that I get connected to. And so every church wants to grow, and some of us are willing to tolerate change, but I would dare say the majority of us don't want conflict. How many of you want a good church fight? Raise your hand. <laughs> you know, 
We want to grow, but not if it involves change, and certainly not if it involves conflict. And that's understandable, because by nature, or by social conditioning, we are creatures that avoid pain. We've learned that from an early age. I can remember my mother telling this story to the rest of us. It involved my older brother, Eric. Now, Eric was probably labeled ADD before they even had that label. He was a hyperactive child, and he really didn't learn very well by someone telling him. He learned better by experiencing. He was probably a kinetic learner. Uh, and uh, my mom tells this story about my brother uh, when she said to him, he was getting ready to reach to put his hand on the hot stove. And my mom says to my brother, don't touch, it's hot. Do you know what he did? He had to touch it and experience it for himself. Some of us learn by watching others, and some of us have to learn the hard way through experience, but all of us learn at some time to avoid pain. And that's a good coping mechanism by and large when it comes to touching something physical like a hot stove. It's not such a good coping mechanism when it deals with getting over psychological and emotional hurts and pain. The very strategy that causes us to avoid pain at all costs is great when it deals with physical pain. It's not so good when you're talking about emotional, psychological pain. Depth psychology tells us the way you get healed of those kinds of hurts is not by avoiding them, but by embracing them. What is it that pain wants to tell us besides do not touch? There are other messages that once you get beneath the pain, you can discover growth. Let me give you an example. There was a man named John Veneer, and he established the La Arch community in Toronto and others, and it was a home for children and adults who were physically challenged and mentally challenged. These are the people that don't have a home unless La Arch provides a home, because society, for one reason or another, says we don't want them. Well, John Veneer uh, said this. He said this about Daniel. Now, Daniel was an individual that had come to him, and, and Daniel suffered from hallucinations, and he was tormented at night through dreams with terrors and nightmares and monsters, and they were always telling Daniel that he wasn't good enough and that no one loved him nor wanted him. And so John Veneer um, said to Henry Nouwen, Henry Nouwen was a renowned uh, theologian, uh, teacher. Uh, he was at Harvard, uh, and Nouwen gave up his prestigious appointment at Harvard. Uh, he took a sabbatical, and he became a resident advisor at La Arch. And one of the great things about Nowen, he says, when he arrived at La Arch, uh, for the first time, no one cared about what he knew. The only thing they cared about was how much he cared for others how he reached out and embraced those who had not been embraced by society, people like Daniel. And so when Nowen came across Nowen, he asked John Veneer, when Nowen came across Daniel, he asked John Veneer, what can we do for him? John says, some hurts cannot be avoided, 
Some hurts must be embraced. We need to love Daniel and come alongside Daniel as the Holy Spirit comes alongside Daniel so that Daniel gets beyond the pain and discovers that he is a beloved child of God whom God loves unconditionally. And so, in many ways, all of us need to get beyond the pain of our childhood hurts to know deep down at the core of our being that we are a beloved child of God whom Christ died for, that we might have life and have it abundantly. But we avoid pain at all cost, and we tend to put it under a rug. And consequently, many churches don't experience growth. They remember a fight that they had in their past, and the last thing they want to do is to do that again, and so they avoid it. Paul has some good words for churches that are struggling with pain. He says to them that they need to get off the milk diet. When he's saying that, he's saying essentially the reason why there's quarrels in the church at Corinth is because people are immature. They're not taking personal responsibility for their growth. They're not embracing the pain and moving beyond the pain to discover what God has in store for them as individuals and as a community of faith. Paul says they're of the flesh. When Paul says they're of the flesh, he's not talking about literal flesh and blood. What Paul is talking about is a way of life that is self-centered. Uh, depth psychologists would call it the ego. You can hear me now, right? <laughs> Suddenly, now if I can only remember where I was. Ego, ego thank you. Uh, Deaf psychologists call it the ego-driven life, and there's a great acronym for ego, and that is edging God out. Think about it. In many ways, the self-centered life edges God out and lives as if we're at the center of the universe. Now, uh, imagine what it would be like if we got off the milk and onto the meat and vegetables. Paul says to the church at Corinth, I wish that you were on the meat and vegetables, but when I came to you, and he's talking about a second time, it had been over a year. Remember, Paul was a church planner. When he comes back at over a year, even though they started out as infants in Christ, he didn't expect them to be infants in Christ when he returned, yet they were because they were quarreling and they weren't taking responsibility for their spiritual growth. They were depending upon the leader to feed them. Did you hear that? That's where you get the nature and the quarreling, saying, I am Paul, I am of Apollos, I follow Peter. And we see that even today, even in mega churches that are, are centered around the cult of the leader. I went to the large church conference, and James Wellman, who is a professor of comparative religion at the University of Washington, he studied the mega church, and he found out the mega church phenomenon is not going away. But what all mega churches have in common is the charisma of the leader. They are leader dependent. As many of us can become leader dependent and expect our leaders to feed us. Now, I know it's not easy making that transition from milk to solid foods. I can remember 
I didn't do a very good job in helping my children make that transition. I can remember when it came time for them to make the transition from milk to solid foods, Catherine said to me, now you can take part in the feeding of our children. Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> and so this is the time when there's Gerber. I don't know, do y'all remember Gerber? And so the, the idea to get your children to really eat solid foods is to make it sound like it tastes good. Am I right with that? And so if they don't like it, what are you supposed to do? Mmm, this is good. Well, I tried it. Ooh, this is bad. I didn't succeed in getting my children to go from milk to solids, I wouldn't, didn't do a very good transition. Catherine was much better. Now, I think sometimes that's an analogy for spiritual leaders as well. Sometimes we like it when our congregation worships us and depends upon us. But that's not the goal that Amy and I have here, is to make you dependent upon us. Our goal is to equip you for ministry and for you to begin to take responsibility for your own spiritual growth. Am I preaching to myself? I don't hear you. And so, I know that we'll begin to take responsibility for our spiritual growth when our members come up to Amy and I and tell us about a quiet time and how God spoke to them. I don't know that our members are taking responsibility for their spiritual growth when they come and tell us about something they learned in their Bible study. I don't know our members are taking responsibility for their spiritual growth when they check out a book in the library and tell me about a book they are reading. Do you know, if I were to tell you that just across the hallway is a storehouse of riches full of gems and gold, nuggets of gold, if you took me literally, do you think we would finish this service? <laughs> that many of you would be rushing in to mine the gems and gold? But I tell you the truth. We have an amazing library full of nuggets and gems about how you grow in Christ and how Christ can make a difference in your life. We even have a librarian who dares to believe that that storehouse of riches can change a person's life. And she volunteers to keep it current. Am I speaking to you, Teresa? I will know that we're taking responsibility for our spiritual growth when that library is used. When you get excited about ministry and mission and you're telling me how Christ has made a difference in your life because you've gotten involved in this or that. You see, it's not about leadership. Paul says it's not Paul and it's not Apollos. It's not the one who plants. It's not the one who waters. It's God who causes the growth. And he says, you are God's servants, God's field, God's building. What's the purpose of a field but to harvest a crop? What's the purpose of a foundation but to build upon it? These are metaphors of growth. What I would ask of you this day is to embrace the pain of change, that you get beyond the discomfort to find out what other messages God might be telling you so that you can be conformed to the image of Christ and discover 
as Daniel learned to discover, at the core of his being, he is a beloved child of God. And that makes all the difference in the world. For God so loved the Daniels of the world. For God so loved you and I that he gave his only begotten son that we might not perish, might not experience simply the rejection of the world, but that we might have everlasting life. May you embrace this life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and respond with an affirmation of faith. That is taken from the Confession of 1967 with the heading, New Life in Christ. And all of God's people said, we believe the reconciling work of Jesus was supreme crisis in the life of humankind. His cross and resurrection become personal crisis and present hope for men when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this experience, the Spirit brings God's forgiveness to individuals, moves them to respond in faith, repentance and obedience and initiates the new life in Christ. The new life takes shape in a community in which individuals know God loves and accepts them in spite of what they are. They therefore accept themselves and love others, knowing that no one has any ground on which to stand except God's grace. The new life finds its direction in the life of Jesus, his deeds and words, his struggles against temptation, his compassion, his anger, and his willingness to suffer death. The teaching of apostles and prophets guide Christians in living this life, and the Christian community nurtures and equips them for their ministries. Life in Christ is life eternal. The resurrection of Jesus is God's sign that he will consummate his work of recreation and reconciliation beyond death and bring to fulfillment the new life begun in Christ. Amen.
You may be seated. And our prayers of the people this day are offered by Deacon Tom Warner. Our prayer this morning is one that was written by Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall was a famous Presbyterian minister in Washington, D.C. during World War II. And he had a unique gift in prayer. Father, I ask thee to take from me now all that does not harass and annoy, all that has laid upon my heart burdens of anxiety and care. I thank thee for stillness of this time of prayer, this oasis in my busy day when I can relax before thee, lay my burden down, and hand over to thee all my anxiety. At this moment, I open my heart to receive thy blessing, knowing that in thy presence the furrows are being smoothed from my brow, the lines from my face, the load from my heart, the doubts from my mind, and the fears from my soul, and I am at peace. And now I thank thee not only for quietness without, but for thy quietness at the heart of the universe and for quietness within. In thy peace, I pray, amen. And now if you enjoy, enjoy with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Out of joy and gratitude for all God has done for us, let us give back with our tithes and offerings. Source of all we hope or dread, sheepdog, jackal, rattler, swan. We hunt your face and long to trust that your hidden mouth would say again, let there be light, a clear new day. But when we thirst in this dry night, we drink from hot wells poisoned with the blood of children. And when we strain to hear a steady homing beam, our ears are balked by stifled moans. Howls of desolation from the throats of sisters, brothers, wild men clawing at the gates for bread. Even our own feeble hands ache to seize the crown you wear and work our private havoc through. source of dark and hate, maker who we beg to be, our mother, father, comrade, mate. Till our few atoms blow to dust, or form again in wiser lives. We seek your face and hear our name in your calm voice the end of night. If dark may end, well spring gold of dark and day. Be here, 
Holy God, we offer you these gifts with thanks, so that together we might plant and water the seeds of your new world. May we be your faithful servants as we cultivate your love, knowing that in all we accomplish, it is you alone who gives the growth. And so we dedicate these, our tithes and offerings, and our very lives to your service. In Christ's name, amen. The Lord be with you. I challenge you and charge you to embrace the pain of change that you might know the transforming power of the gospel to conform you to the image of Christ and know deep down you are a beloved child of God. Go and share that message to one and all for the sake of the Daniels of this world.
for your sake and my sake, for the whole world's sake. Let us be the hands and feet and heart of Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said,